The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. Step outside of your comfort zone. See the world with a whole new perspective. Join us and experience the unexplained on the Paranormal View. And welcome everybody right here to the Paranormal View on Parax Radio Network. I want to thank everybody for being with us tonight and those listening here in the chat room and those listening from around the world. We appreciate each and every one of you. Uh, if you're listening from somewhere else and you'd like to come join everybody here in the chat room, feel free to come over to paraxradio.com and uh, click on the chat now button and you will be uh, in with all these wonderful people. You'll be able to interact with them and interact with us. Um uh, you can ask questions tonight of our guest uh, by sending a private uh, chat to either Ceiling Cat or myself, Henry Foister, and we will get those answered for you. And uh, if you're somewhere else and you've got a question but you don't want to come to the chat room, you can do so by sending a question to theparanormalview at gmail.com and just put attention question on it, and we will get those answered for you. Um, I got with us... Uh, Barbara Duncan. Hello, everybody. And I've got Jeffrey Gould. Hello, hello. I hope I'm sounding okay because you're cutting in and out a bit uh, on me, for me. Now you well, sound fine for me. Yep. Cool. Sounded okay. Um, so uh, we have a, a great guest uh, tonight, and uh, yes. we'll get uh, Jeff here to introduce her in just a second. Um, we did have a real good show last week, and uh, if you missed it, you can always catch it. It was our 10th anniversary show, so we had a, a whole lot of people in the chat room and a whole lot of people on the air trying to talk, but mm -hmm. uh, I think it went, went very well. So uh, with that, uh, why don't you, because I've got a whole bunch of questions, and I know Barbara's got a lot too, or Cat does anyway. Uh, why don't you introduce our guest, Jeff? Yes, yeah, so well, tonight's returning guest is uh, Blake, uh, Deborah Blake, the author of numerous books on modern witchcraft, as well as the Baba Yaga series, the Rider series, and the Veiled Magic series of paranormal romance, urban fantasies. So, welcome back, uh, Deborah Blake. Thank Let's you. See. So happy to be here. All right. Uh, people said I was sounding kind of quiet here in the chat room. See if it's come up a little bit. I turned it up just a little bit. See if that's okay now for me. Uh, and happy 10th anniversary. Yeah, it went by kind of fast, I think. <laughs> I don't know where it went to. <laughs> well, you know what they say, time flies when you're having fun. Uh, yeah, I don't want it to go by too fast, though. <laughs> uh, all right, we're going to be talking about cat magic tonight. And... Um, We've had you on before, and we always like having you because we can ask a question and just let you talk half the night. So uh, that's, <laughs> that, that's good for us. I, I think I just got subtly <laughs> insulted. <laughs> no, no, no. That's good for us. <laughs> well, yeah, but tonight I'm going to make you talk. Yeah, we're going to ask a lot of questions. That's all what we're going to do. The cat's uh, going to ask a lot the, of questions. You're the, not kidding me. The cat, yes. And uh, I've got a bunch of those for it, too. Um, cat magic. Um, you talk about right to start with uh, what you, I guess you have uh, cat, uh, you use components uh, used in spells. How is a cat used in spells? Well, first of all, um, as you would discover if you read the little book of cat magic, um, the cat will pretty much be used any way it feels like being used and not in any other way than that. If anybody has cats, they know that. Um, cats 
play different roles. I mean, there are some cats that are specifically familiars. My my cat Magic, the cat queen of the universe, who um, put her two paws worth in this book, um, was in fact a magical cat, and she would come out and take part in rituals and you know lend her energy. Um, you, when I had my my group would get together, Blue Moon Circle. Uh, she would, if we were inside, and you know, we would we would have our our altar set up in the middle of the living room. She would come into the room and walk around the circle, greet everyone, uh, which let us know that it was time to start the ritual. And then she would either sit under the altar or on the couch behind us and supervise. And when we were done, she would you know, come and and you. Know, stride out of the room so he knew everything was over not all cats are familiars though so um you know the alternatives are to do spells for your cat or just sort of getting you know using that feline energy or if you're if you're doing uh spells for your cat you can use you know components from them as long as they're you know, taken in a humane way, like if a cat loses a whisker or uh, sheds a claw, which they do uh, in a natural kind of way, you can use those elements to uh, work magic for their benefit. Or, or you know, if you're brushing the cat, you can save some of the fur, that kind of thing. You know, don't, don't go, don't go, you know, torturing your cat to get their little bits and pieces, that's wrong, and the gods will smoke you. Certainly bast. Yes. Well, not to mention the cat will smoke you, too. So Yeah, pretty much. They know where you sleep. Yeah. And eat and pee. <laughs> oh, yeah. They know where you put your slippers. Yes. Exactly. Which, which is, um, speaking of that, um, we, we have two cats. And every so often... Only two? That's hardly any. Yeah, that's plenty for me. Um, <laughs> but but there's many times when Patsy will go downstairs to go to put her shoes on, and there's one of their little stuffed toys inside one of her shoes where they take it over there and put it in her shoe. Oh, they brought her a gift. That's so sweet. Yep, yep. They do that. I usually throw up in my shoes. <laughs> I, I think a, a nice little stuffed toy would be lovely. A lot better than murder presents. Little yes, nice yes. Stuff. <laughs> uh, you talk uh, about cats from uh, other lands. Um, do different breeds of cats make a difference in the spell? Not really. Um, you know, I think in general, cat energy is cat energy. I mean, there's a lot of intriguing history of cats from different lands, which I talk about in the book, um, just just because it's cool. Um, you know, I mean, l- learning about how different cultures looked at cats and how it all sort of comes down to the way we look at cats um, yeah, that's, that's one thing, but really when it comes to doing magic, um, each individual cat has his or her own personality, but it doesn't have so much to do with what kind of cat they are, it has more to do with, uh, I guess you could say what kind of cat they think they are. Or a tiger. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. Panther, you know, lion, tiger, um, giant prehistoric, you know, something. It really depends on the cat. And even maybe even a velociraptor. <laughs> yeah, could be. All right, Barbara. Play with the claws. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I'm fascinated with the the difference in the cat histories because it seems that even throughout history cats somehow were venerated almost in every culture i mean there were a few cultures where they got a bad rap uh once you get into sort of medieval england things did not go well for them but in the earlier cultures 
um, you know, certainly in Egypt, which, you know, we, we all know cats were worshipped, um, and rightfully so, I might say. Um, but, uh, you know, there are a lot of cultures in which cats were considered to be sacred. Uh, I love this quote by Terry Pratchett, which was, uh, thousands of years ago, cats were worshipped as gods. Cats have never forgotten this. And if you have a cat, you will know that that is true. But yes, Egypt, India, Persia, Japan, and China, um, you know, they, there were a lot of cultures in which they were considered to be um, either sacred or magical or both. Um, one of my, my favorite tales is from Persia, uh, where it's said that the Prophet Muhammad loved cats and there's a famous story about how his favorite cat, uh, Meuza, fell asleep on his arm. And rather than disturb the cat, he cut the sleeve off of his robe. Um, and so, you know, those of us who have tried not to disturb our sleeping cats can, can really understand that. If I had a nickel for every time when I should have gotten up and didn't because there was a cat perfectly comfortable on my lap, and I thought, well, I'll just you know, read one more chapter of this book before I get up and do the house cleaning because the cat's comfortable. Yeah. Well, I actually, I remember reading that in uh, one of Ripley's Believe It or Nots about the sleeping kitten on his uh, the long sleeve of his robe. Mm -hmm. You don't want to wake him up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Well, yeah. And, and it's interesting because what happened in the Middle Ages in Europe uh, when they just decided that cats were bad and they got rid of them, uh, didn't realize that the cats were keeping the the mice and rodent population down, which was the keeping cause of the Black the Death. Away, so, I mean, which, they pretty much, yeah. Yeah, they pretty much called, caused Kitty, the Black Kitty Death. Karma. Yeah, although a pretty drastic, pretty drastic form of karma. But yeah, it, it, that's pretty much where it started going wrong was for some reason um, around that time, people started to uh, view cats as evil, um, in part because uh, they were associated with witches who were also thought to be evil. I don't understand where that comes from. We're all lovely people. Um, Plus, but, they were, witches were the original teachers and healers and wise women. Well, of the, and herbalists, really. they were very yeah. often, you know, the, the wise women or wise people, because some of them were men, um, in the village. And they were healers, and they were the people who passed down the lessons. And unfortunately, when um, the church moved in, that was a threat, because it was all about political power. Yep. And... Um, and, yeah, the poor cats got dragged into that. And, uh, yeah, in the, the 1200s, uh, Pope Gregory IX issued what's called a papal bull, which, I mean, it sounds like it's a rude thing, but no, it just meant it was an official announcement, saying the cats were evil and in league with Satan, and people started killing them. And, yes, sadly, after that, um, you know, bad things happened. Yep. Uh, now, we uh, we was talking about uh, the different types of cats in different lands, and uh, what is the differences of the cats, like in Egypt and India and Persia, Japan, China, Rome, Greece? Uh, well, you know, I mean, there's there's different breeds of cats. Uh, for instance, one of my my new cats is uh, part. Probably either Maine Coon Cat or Norwegian Forest Cat. Uh, they're they're cold weather cats, and you can tell because they have very long fur and double coats and big poofy tails and you know big fur coming out of their ears and their paws actually have tufts of fur coming out between them. His name is Koshka, um, actually named after a, a character in one of my books who was a who was a dragon disguised as a cat which when i saw him i went yeah if there was ever a dragon disguised as a cat that's that's him um but he's got about like a two inch 
puff of fur that comes out of his between his toes and it's because it helped them walk on snow and ice so cats evolved um in different ways depending on you know the climate where they were and because they're all you know descended from wild wild cats you know they have they have different markings they have different um attitudes but you know let's face it all cats have attitudes oh yeah well, I actually have one of the one of the four cats I have is um, actually two of them are brothers, and uh, if if you don't know them well enough, you, it's easy not to to have a trouble telling them apart. I can tell them apart. Oliver is on the bed right now. Yeah, how's it going? Um, and he's uh, a gigantic fluff ball with a Swiffer tail, uh, mm-hmm. but he's a, but he's a blonde ginger cat. As really? A, as is his brother Oscar, who's more streamlined whereas oliver has more of a thicker mane around his uh face oliver yeah looks, koshka's oscar got that rough more... that looks like a big yeah. mane around his face he's my little lion yeah and and oscar is more streamlined he has more of a uh, streamlined head and he's a third smaller than oliver who's just decided that my petting him means he should get up and be petted so now he's being all affectionate he well, he course, and of course he he's psychic about him he he's also psychic. He knows exactly when I want to take a nap, even if it's not at the same time. If I'm thinking, ah, you know, I'm really tired, I should just lie down for a bit. Zoom! Oliver comes running in, and he's like, "Okay, dibs, your arms, my, you know, that's where I'm sleeping too." So <laughs> he's climbing up on me. Yeah, we have a, a I guess it's a, a gray striped uh, male cat, and. Uh, it like stands higher in the back than it does in the front and its back paws will angle out. And when it walks, it kind of struts, you might say. I've never seen one well, walking like that. Well, that's interesting. It's, and, and I swear up and down it's Egyptian or something, but uh, we, we have no idea. She got it from the shelter. And we have right. No well, all my, all my cats are rescues. So, that in fact, Koshka and his sister Ember who does not, in fact, have the mane. She's got very soft fur, but she she's actually got gray fur with bits of orange in it, hence the name Ember. Um, and so you can tell she's a little something, but she doesn't look anything like that. And, yeah, they came from this 25-cat hoarding situation. So we only have sort of a vague idea of their age, and he clearly was supposed to be a really large cat, and... Probably will not be because I think they were you know really deprived when they were young, and the third new cat Harry Dresden um, came from you know another rescue organization. You know all my all my guys comes either from shelters or rescue organizations. You know let's face it, there there are so many cats that need homes. Was he named after the character in the Dresden Files? <laughs> well, yes and no. Uh, he was. But um, on on the Twitter, um, I am friends with. Uh, well, his his handle is at Harried Wizard, and he is Harry Dresden on Twitter. He is not the author, uh, Jim Butcher. He's he is somebody who has sort of manifested that character, and this is a point of pride for me. Uh, he has. I think over 8,000 followers and follows 50 some people, one of whom is me, which cool. I think is pretty much, you know, means I'm officially cool. So the cat <laughs> is, in fact, actually named after the guy on Twitter. But yes, it is, it is named after the character Harry Dresden, the wizard, because wizards and witches have to stick together. Yeah. Does, does your cats talk? Uh, Harry does, actually. Koshka and Ember are fairly quiet. Ember occasionally makes some noise. You know, Harry, if if the food is not being uh, processed quickly enough for him, I get meow, 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 meow. And I just, I recently took the three of them to the vet for their shots and their checkups. And all the way there, there was protestations the other two were reasonably quiet you know ember would occasionally make a little complaint but no he was mouthy as heck well uh, 
our the one I was just talking about that waddles kind of. Um, there is a ton of toys around the house on the floor, little plush toys that they. Oh yeah, play we are with. we are toy central here with the half grown cats. Anything to keep them from torturing or breaking the rest of my house. Well, at night sometimes he'll be downstairs. He'll be coming up the stairs, and you hear this oh, 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 oh and he's carrying one of those in his mouth <laughs> oh my God, and hollering like at baby? the same time. Yeah, no, he's not a baby. He's probably five five years old, maybe six. Yeah, but sounding like a baby. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, and he's carrying it, carrying one of those in his mouth. Yeah. Oh, I had a cat that used to do that. She would carry things around. And sometimes it was toys. Sometimes it would be, you know, like if I left my socks on the floor, she would carry a sock around and make this horrendous muted yowling noise. Like, and, uh, you know, it was clearly some sort of a mothering thing. But yeah, it was it was not pleasant. <laughs> yeah, that was that was Minerva, the mother of of magic, and her her brother, the giant gray cat Mystic. And uh, yeah, she was she was a little odd. I mean, she she'd had a rough time, and you could tell. Now, the you you had one here called Cats in Europe, and uh, what got me was you also put. In parentheses, you put the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> so, yeah, well, <laughs> that pretty much describes all the cats everywhere. But yeah, I mean, it, that was the point where, where in theory, they became associated with evil things, and black cats especially um, got a really bad rap. Um, which, you know, which was not good for black cats then. And it is still, it's amazing to me how many people still have a bad association with black cats. Wow. Well, now, my I, friends, you know, uh, two of my four are black, so I happen to like black cats. Yeah, we, we have, uh, Bart is a black cat we have, and he's got, if you look at the 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 peak of his back, he's like these thirteen individual white fur, just strands of white oh, fur. Oh, interesting! Uh, but if you don't really look for them, you know, we know they're there. So I always say, you know, he's a mostly black cat. He's like ninety nine point nine nine nine. Yeah, Harry Dresden is black, but he has a little sort of scattering of white hairs randomly. In his fur, which a friend of mine calls constellations, which I really love. Yeah, uh, yeah it's, I mean, I had never seen a cat. You know, I've had lots of black cats in my life. And, and I've had some that had, you know, that little white spot on their breast or, um, you know, Magic, the cat queen of the universe. Um, when you pushed her fur back, it was actually gray underneath. Her mother and her brother were gray. So that when she shed... She didn't shed black, she shed gray, which was fun for my black clothes. Um, but yeah, Harry's got this neat little, I mean, when you look at him, he's, he appears to be completely black. But when you get closer, you can see here and there just these little, like a few white hairs here and a few white hairs there. But there's no patches of white. It's you know, he, yeah. he does seem to be, and he's got that sort of sleek panther look. Barbara? Yeah. Well, Bart's like 16 pounds, so we we joke that he's this big, fat jaguar. <laughs> yeah, Mystic was huge. He was he was 18 at his highest and, and 17 for most of his life, and he was just gigantic. I mean, he his shoulders were a good two inches over, you know, above his, his mother and his sister, who were normal-sized cats. And I live in an old farmhouse, and when he came down the stairs, the whole house would shake. Yeah. Wow. Mind you, that's partially just the house. <laughs> that's interesting. I don't know if you're aware, but in America, the the bad PR is that black cats are the evil cats or unlucky cats. And in England, white cats are considered unlucky. You know, I'd heard that. And it's sort of funny because y you have to wonder. I mean, the black thing, you can sort of figure out where that came from. You know, the you know, 
the black is evil or dark or bad. White cats, I, I don't know why anybody would think that, although a lot of white, pure white cats are deaf. So maybe people just thought they were spooky. Well, my first, the first cat I uh, rescued was uh, an all-white cat, and although he had selective hearing as to when <laughs> to, you know, uh, he he was he could hear very well, and I I, I knew that he could because I could. Cl- uh, he actually responded to his name. His original name was Breezy, and I thought, well, that's not going to work. So I I named him Bast, uh, not realizing that Bast is a, a goddess, not a god. But neither he nor Bast, uh, the, the goddess cared apparently because uh, well, he took right to it and you know if i called him from a distance he would come running yeah i had two uh, cat black cats whose names were Lares and penates they were named after the greek gods that were demigods that were guardians of the household uh they were sort of household spirits and when we adopted them they were barn cats we were told they were boys so we gave them boy names and then they had babies and it turned out that, in fact, they were not boys. Um, but but those were their names, and they had they were still guardians of the household and were happy to, you know, guard us from, you know, mice and all sorts of other critters. Um, and, and, you know, they didn't seem to care that they had, theoretically, the wrong names either. So, uh, you know, I guess they just make them their own. Yeah. Well, it's... Um... It's like we we had a uh, back when I lived back east. We had uh, neighbors who had just gotten a dog that they were calling King, and uh, it didn't take me more than two seconds to realize you know this is a girl dog, right? And you're like, <laughs> oh no no no, this is a boy dog, and eventually she they had a tell litter. The difference on a dog? I had no idea what was wrong with them. I'm like, I mean, no, it has seriously, to be this pretty is... hard to tell. Yeah. Dogs usually it's fairly obvious. Exactly, they and outies. Yep, and um, but eventually she she had puppies because you know our our dog was spayed. She wasn't, and my dog's boyfriend wasn't neutered, <laughs> and. Um, you know, by that time they said, "Well, we'll we'll call her Queenie." I'm like, "Well, now it's too late. Her name is she knows her name is King." Exactly. So my brother and I just spelled it Q I N G. <laughs> That's quite clever. Wow. <clears throat> Barbara, I know you got a bunch of questions. Now, I find it fascinating that um, the 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 story is that cats rarely talk to each other, but they do talk a lot to humans. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah I mean, they'll, they'll meow and hiss at each other. Right. But when it comes to talk, now when Moo, when I get home every evening, we have a ritual, Moo has to meow a lot. She runs into the bedroom, onto the bed, so that I will come up and rub her tummy. Of course. <laughs> and she'll meow the entire time. <laughs> really? It's like, well, this is what happened today, and you weren't around. And that's right. I'm going to update you. Here's um, the here's the news of the day. <laughs> well, my theory is that cats don't really need to talk to each other because they're all telepathic, which is how they know when you're thinking about putting them in the carrier to go to the vet. Um, you know, it doesn't matter if the carrier has been sitting out there for three days; they somehow know when you're thinking about using it. The only reason they talk to you is they think you're, you know, stupid because you're not telepathic and therefore they actually have to tell you stuff. Oh, no, yeah. And I find that very true in that, you know, I can walk in the door with the flea, you know, drops in. Oh, the- yeah. Forget it. You'll never see them. She just, you know, uh, whoops. For some you- reason. <laughs> That's why I wait till they're asleep. <laughs> That's that's how the the nail clipping happens here. I I mostly wait till they're asleep and and then I get two or three clipped and then they figure out that what I'm doing they wake up they take off and you know then I do the next couple the next time. Although I will say the new guys um who my my old my old bunch of cats I called them uh the furball gang. And, you know, Angus is the only one left of the furball gang. The new ones are called the Wild Bunch because they really are. But they're pretty cooperative about 
things like getting their nails clipped. And, and Koshka, the long-haired one, thankfully really loves to get brushed, which makes my life a lot easier. And he'll actually not only let me brush him, but then he'll roll over and give me his belly to brush. Oh, wow. I had a kid named Sado who would love to have his nails clipped. You know, he would sit in my lap and he'd hold his paw up. Really? I was finished with one paw. He put it down and he'd pick up his other paw. Wow. He, he just was just the sweetest little thing in the world. He just liked his manicure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he just loved manicures. Yeah. <laughs> and I was fortunate reason, enough. Yeah. And Moo, I was fortunate. Yeah. Moo loves having her butt rubbed. Really? Which yes. I always. Yeah, the back of the skirt, the back of her That's legs. That's unusual. Yeah. I mm. know. And, and it's just like, are you a cat or a dog? What's going well, on? Well, you here? know, Harry Dresden does this funny thing. If I go into the bedroom and he's lying on the bed, he will, you know, give me that cute sort of cockhead look and then roll over on his back and show me his belly just like a dog and do that sort of rolling back and forth. Look how cute I am. Look how cute I am. And he he wants me to go over and roll his rub his belly, and he will purr and purr and purr. And many male cats, you try that, you will lose a hand. Yep. A lot, yeah. A lot of male cats don't like their belly rub, but he mm. just thinks it's the best thing ever. I trained all I I each of the four cats I have I raised from kittens. They came in very sickly, and uh, I was charged with you know taking care with them, and they just stuck around. Um, and I raised them. From uh, uh, Puka and Sprite first from kittens, and a year later, Oscar and Oliver showed up. Um, and so I've trained them what behaviors to be cool with, including but not limited to uh, essentially being completely tactile. Um, Oliver, Oliver, how you doing? Um, he's, they're all belly rub cats. Uh, the gingers don't like their nails trimmed. If I can do it, I will. They also do not like to flee stuff. They will flee. Um, Puka and Sprite, you can sneak up on them with the flea stuff. But both Puka and Sprite will let me trim their nails without a problem. They're just like, all right, let's get it over with. Yeah, these guys are mostly pretty good. Thankfully, I do not have to deal with the flea stuff because my guys don't go outside. So, you know, we are pretty much safe from that unless somebody picks up something from somewhere, like you know, if we go to the vet or something, or if a mouse comes in and brings a stray flea. But in general, we don't have to deal with that, for which I'm extremely grateful. Well, theoretically, these guys are not outdoor cats, but they get out. You know they'll they'll ninja past you, and oh, yeah. um, uh, it's sometimes it's trickier to catch the orange kids because they're just sort of like okay hide, you know, and they're like now we can play, and they'll just you know come in when they're ready, uh, but when they are ready, and if I'm coming out like all right where are they whichever one's out, um, they they'll just roll over. And they're like, okay, I'm ready to go in. And that's their signal, like, okay, boom, and they'll fall down and completely filthize themselves. <laughs> you know, like, how dirty can I get? And I'm like, I yeah. My, I used to have cats that went outside, and it was quite the adventure. When I moved to the house I'm at now, which is in the, in the country, I've got coyotes in the hills and ah. foxes and a, a, a country road that people drive at insane speeds down. And I, I just said, well, we're going to try doing the indoor cat thing. And it's, you know, I've been here 17 years and I'm on my second batch of indoor cats. And they all seem fine. Although, you know, Harry Dresden is very fast and he does make a run for it. But I'm very fortunate. I have a mud room, which I call the airlock, which, you know, the there's the door from the kitchen into the mud room and then from the mud room outside. And so even if a cat makes it into the mud room, as long as that outdoor door is closed, which it is supposed to be, they can't get any further. So that's pretty much been my saving grace. And you're yeah, the second I, person, yeah, I've heard talk about a cat airlock. Yeah, yeah cat it's, airlock. it's a wonderful and that's, thing. that's what we used to call our mudroom back east. Yep. Well, and, you know, I mean, I, it's the back door because I live in the country and everybody goes in and out of the back door. If people come to my front door, which does not have an airlock, I just sort of point them around the house because I'm not opening that door. It's too dangerous. 
Okay, I want to remind everybody, if you do have questions, you can private chat them to myself uh, or Ceiling Cat, and we will get those answered for you. Um, lots, of, lots of good stuff going on. Uh, great book. And um, let's see, uh, Barbara, I know you still got a bunch. Why don't you do one more before we uh, go take a break? How does that sound? Or did I lose did you? Fall, did she fall off? No, I'm here. Oh, she's, <laughs> she's thinking very hard. <laughs> Does that? Well, I you can know, tell from here, you got this cat, and they're, you know, she likes to bite ankles, and oh. so I have to swat around. And uh, Puka's a bear. God help you if you have bare feet, because he was like toes, <laughs> but he just sort of. He doesn't bite them. He just rolls on them. Doesn't make sense. It's, yeah. This is kind of, kind of fun to have to work around kitty cats, but they do that. Uh, and, and it's odd because, you know, I have candles set up at home, and we you're talking in your book about, you know, things that you can and can't do around kitty cats, and one of them is usually fire <laughs> and candles. Uh, she never really bothers them. Well, you know, it depends on the cat and it depends. I, you know, I have a, a number of altars, but the, the main one that I burn candles on is high enough up so that the candles are out of reach. Now, mind you, you know, when I, when the, my group does ritual, it's on a low table and we have candles lit and nobody ever bothered them. So, you know, to some extent, it really depends on the cat. Um, before we would start ritual, magic would jump up on the table because she had a thing about sage. And if you had the sage wand out there, she would, you know, get up and, and grab it and pull it to pieces. She really loved sage. Um, but you know, once we were in the middle of ritual and actually doing ritual, she never would jump up on the, on the altar. Um, but you know, if you don't know what your cat does. You know, if you're if you're not sure if you haven't done ritual around your cat before, you definitely want to be careful about fire. You also want to be careful about things like essential oils, um, some of which can be poisonous to cats or not very good for them. I actually had a cat many years ago uh, when it was in an apartment who, uh, you know, I had one of those oil diffusers that, you know, you put water in a couple of drops of, of essential oil and put a little candle underneath. And, um, the first thing that he did was sat there one day with his tail right over the candle. And I didn't realize it until I started smelling burning fur. And there he was with his tail perched over the candle. He obviously didn't know anything was going on. And, you know, so I realized that was not a good idea. Um, he was okay. You know, he didn't burn himself. He just singed a few hairs. Um, but there was a time when I put a few drops of peppermint essential oil into this diffuser. Turns out that peppermint is related to catnip. They're both in the mint family. And this poor cat, you know, was attracted to this water and, and essential oil mix and, you know, took a couple of sips out of it and then foamed at the mouth for about a half an hour. Wow. Luckily, he was he was okay. You know, I of course was completely panicked. He was completely panicked and running around the house. You know, as I'm trying to catch him and rinse his mouth out with water. But you do want to be careful about the witchy tools that you use because certainly there are some herbs that are dangerous to cats, or even things like peppermint, which you know in theory will not hurt the cat. He, yeah, you know, essential oils are very strong, and you don't really want them getting into them. Um, and there's things that they're attracted to. I mean, thankfully, you know, magic with the sage, she just made a mess. It didn't hurt her. She didn't eat it. She just, you know, sort of uh, shredded it. Uh, and But, uh, you know, there are lots of herbs that we use in witchcraft that are, in fact, not safe for cats. And so... If you are not sure that your cat will stay away from those kind of things, you will want to be careful. And, of course, if you have anything that's sharp, some people's athames are, in fact, sharp, um, and, and some are not, you just want to be careful. All right. Um, 
I think what we're going to do is go ahead and take us a quick break. And uh, when we come back, uh, we've got plenty more to talk about. So, um, Jeff, why don't you uh, take us out for a quick break? Yeah, well, you're listening to The Paranormal View on para-x.com with your hosts, Henry Foister, Seal and Cat Barbara Duncan, and myself, Jeffrey Gould, and tonight's returning guest author, Deborah Blake. So stay tuned for more of The Paranormal View after the break. Whether you're listening at home, at work, or anywhere, thanks for making Para-X part of your day. Your source for everything paranormal, Para-X. And welcome back, everybody, right here to the Paranormal View on the Parex Radio Network. I want to thank everybody for being with us tonight, those here in the chat room and those listening from around the world. We appreciate each and every one of you. So, uh, we uh, have with us Barbara Duncan. I'm still here. And Jeffrey Gould. Hello. And our great guest. Deborah Blake. Meow. And we're talking about cat magic. Uh, I almost thought we were going to find out where, from where we had listeners. Is the way that's out. Uh, well, we are, if Barbara has it. I do. Oh. We got listeners from all over the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, and our friends in the Netherlands. Oh, all right. Welcome. Wow. I'm glad everybody's listening tonight then. Uh, yeah, it's a section in there I thought was uh, pretty interesting, and I figured we can talk a whole lot about this. It's uh, fascinating facts about cats, and uh, the first one you had is a, a group of cats is called a clouder. A clouder, yep. Which, uh... Yeah, I, I love doing the research for this book because I just found the most fun things. I I actually did not know that clouder fact. I I always called a group of cats a pain in my butt. But you know that's <laughs> that's a whole different technical term. Um, but yeah, did you know? See, that, I always thought it was a street gang. A street gang. <laughs> yeah. <'cause, laughs> well, you know, unless they're in the kitchen, and then they're a kitchen gang. Um, but yeah, did you know that cats sleep for seventy percent of their lives? I could probably guess that as much as mine sleeps. <laughs> yeah, well, and considering that my my younger ones now, you know, are up and around a fair amount, I think as they get older, it becomes more and more. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's pretty amazing. Things like uh, they have over twenty muscles that control their ears. Yes, I don't know about you, but I can't move my ears at all. And and the things that they can hear. Um, oh yeah, it's it's uh, that's their the strongest of their senses, and they can hear um, sounds as high as sixty four kilohertz compared to us measly humans who can only hear twenty kilohertz, yeah. which probably explains why they can hear the cat op- can opener no matter where they are. Yes, uh, we have little pop top cans, yeah. and they're right. Oh there. yeah, and uh-huh. then they're, or the treat can. I have, you know, one of those jugs of treats, uh-huh. and as soon as I take it off the counter, I mean, I don't even have to knock it up and down or anything. I just take just, it off the counter, and no matter where in the house they are, boom, right they're there. there. Yes, they are. Um, you also uh, said that uh, cats can't taste uh, sweetness. I don't know. Isn't that sad? And and God only knows how the scientists figured that out. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, did they take a poll? It's you know, I I don't know, but that's that's what they say. Um, you know, although you know there are cats with sweet tooths. My cat Magic, uh, who is you know, talked about a lot in this book, as as with many of my previous books, um, she she you know there were notes from Magic the cat, which made this pretty bittersweet when it came out and she was gone um but she actually liked berries and i would be you know have blueberries or raspberries or you know something like that in my cereal bowl 
And, you know, she'd sit on my lap and that little black paw would dart out, grab a berry, not the milk, but a berry, and she would eat them. So she clearly tasted something in them. Might not have been sugar, but, right. you know, it was, it was something. She, I wonder if they can actually taste the stuff, but not whether it's sweet Right, or not. It, it apparently just isn't sweet to them. Right. Although, again, I don't know how the scientists know that. I mean, presumably it has something to do with testing what appealed to them and, and didn't appeal to them. Maybe they just don't like sweet. Yeah. You know? Well, or or maybe they can test the sensors on their tongues. I don't know. Which which uh, comes to the. I next. don't want to be the one put wiring up a cat's tongue to see what it can taste. Yeah, <laughs> I I don't think that would go well. Yeah. Well, and one of my one of my favorite cat facts: cats make more than a hundred different sounds. Dogs make around ten, yeah. thus proving the cat's superiority. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They they can talk a lot easier, I guess. <laughs> well, they managed to figure out that whereas humans domesticated dogs, cats saw the logic in um, working with humans because humans had food, and the food attracted rodents inside. Cats figured, well, you know, this is where the rodents are. So they started hanging out. They literally chose voluntarily to domesticate. Oh themselves. yeah, and and they can unchoose you at any time, and they oh, they will you. let you know that. Okay, here's another one of my cool facts that I really loved: the frequency the frequency of a domestic cat's purr is the exact same one at which muscles and bones repair themselves. Uh, See, how wonder, cool is that? I wonder if a cat laying on your lap is purring, if it would help the bones and stuff like that heal. I'm, in, I'm in your pretty body. sure um, owning a cat can lessen the risk of stroke and heart attack by a third. So they're clearly doing something. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, you know, they also uh, have detected cancer in their owners. I actually, I have a friend. This happened with her husband. Um, they had. One of their cats was would for about I, I forget if it was six months or a year kept licking the same spot at the base of his neck, and they could not figure why this cat would not leave that spot alone. Turned out he had a brain tumor on his brain stem, huh. exactly where the cat had been licking. Really, wow! Cancer's delicious. Hmm. So you know, if they had listened to the cat earlier, he would have saved himself a lot of trouble. That's yeah. a pretty major brain surgery. And but yeah, it, it's a it's a fascinating thing. So, you know, now I just worry whenever my cats lick me. I'm like, <laughs> oh my god, are they trying to tell me something? Uh well cats uh well normally when cats lick me it's, or when Moo licks me, it's, it's I think she's tasting whether or not she wants to bite down. <laughs> uh, uh cats can taste the air also. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. When they sometimes they they are sort of breathing through their mouths, and they're actually uh, it looks like they're making a face, but they are actually sensing things in the air with an extra organ that they have that we don't have. Which Call can the Jacobs the air Jacob. sometimes for for poor Barbara with the smoke in the air. That's probably a good thing. Yeah, that's the uh, yeah. Jacobson organ. Well, aren't you smart? I work with animals. (laughs) And uh, cats' uh, night sight is seven times better than humans. They are superior in every way. They can also jump up to six times their own length. I don't know about you. I cannot do that. My first cat was a klutz and a half, whereas (laughs) the second cat I had, who was like twice his size... Uh, she could levitate like a bubble, and he could, you know, I'm I'm sure if he came across a pile of bricks, he could probably knock them over. Uh, he it was hilarious because he could jump, kind of like three feet maybe pretty well, but anything more than that, and he just became a mess. It was it was pretty hilarious. But he, he also insisted he bonded to me so much because he had come from a household of sixteen, uh, like sixteen or twenty two cats. 
and uh, the owner had died, and they no one shelter could take all of them. So they split them into like three clusters, and our shelter got um, a, a section. And I went in because we started having a house pro- a house mouse problem, and um, so I was tasked to find a find a proper cat. And I saw this white cat. I thought, oh, you're kind of cute. And I opened the cage, and uh, this cat literally just hugged me in a, please, for God's sake, help me, help me, help me. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I guess it's you then. All right, well, that was quick. Um, and what was funny was he wasn't a proper mouser. He would kill mice, but you had to give them to him. And he knew where he knew that the mice were in the pantry, but he would just sit there like, I, I, I got nothing. I don't know what to do. And it was clear he wasn't top cat on the totem pole where he had come from. So being the the main cat, he, he just thought he was uh, had, you know, suddenly inherited a million kitty dollars or whatever. So he would sleep in my arms every night. Aww. And um, he insisted I sleep on my right side, with my arm a certain way so he could sleep paws up against my chest. And every so often... What I would do is I would play letting Bass sleep through de- uh, bedtime, and he'd be asleep in the, the TV room on the first floor, and I'd go upstairs and go to bed, and at about 1 or 2 o'clock, he would wake up like, oh my goodness, I slept through bedtime, and he would come running up, and he would physically wake me up <laughs> to make come under the covers, turn around, roll, and sleep in my arms. Well, you know, they are the boss of us. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, Mine. some more than others. You know, but, uh, yeah, you know, Magic, you know, was pretty much my supervisor. She would, when I was writing, she would sit either, if I was at the desktop, she would sit next to the keyboard with her head resting on the edge of the keyboard, which occasionally led to some very unfortunate things. Um, And if I was sitting on the couch, which I often do, uh, you know, I have one of those recliner couches so I can have my legs out in front of me with a laptop, and she would sit up on the couch behind me but always supervising me apparently she did not trust me to write by myself <laughs> yeah, well, it's like cats can't you know have to supervise us going to the bathroom too oh yeah but if i take a shower i come outside and koshka and his sister ember are sitting outside the it's like they think i'm going to vanish I don't, I don't know, but yeah, they are always right outside the door. They're not scratching on the door. They're just sitting and waiting as if to say, you know, really, did you, you know, leave any water for anybody else? <laughs> yeah. Well, that was another thing I trained, uh, at least Puka and Sprite was where, when I was staying in the, the, the house next door, uh, they had a glass booth shower. And as kittens, I would bring them into the shower with me and wash them when I took a shower so that they would get used to wet. Because I knew eventually something's going to happen and they're going to be messed up and I'm going to need to bathe them. Right. And so they were like, oh, this. Oh, all right. Fine. You know, but and but they never fought. You know, if I brought them in there, they'd be like, oh, it's this. Oh, fine. Whatever. Yeah. You know, and but they would never fight and I would never I've never been clawed or had a problem with it. Now, female cats use their right paw, and male cats uh, use their left paw. Okay. It's 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 kind of cool. I mean, there's there's all sorts of of really neat things. Um, yeah, I mean, they're sort of the female cats are are right pawed, like people are right handed or left handed, and male cats apparently are left pod uh you know unless you're trying to steal their food in which case they are both pod um <laughs> and you're in big trouble uh wow um barbara i think we're leaving you out kind of uh, no oh, oh well. uh, i'm listening uh, uh, but well i want to move on because um uh, again this is one of um kitty's questions which is uh cat naming Cat uh, what? Cat naming. Oh, name. Ah, cat because, naming. Because, yeah, she unfortunately uh, is a cow cat, um, which is the white and black splotched cats. Uh, I have a, a friend oh, who has a black, and white, a black and white cat who looks like almost like a Palomino horse. Yeah. And that, that cat is, in fact, named Cow Cat. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 
Um, and it's, you know, capital C, capital C, all one word, cow, cat, cat. and, and, you know, gigantic cat, really, really gorgeous. Um, yeah, the, the interesting thing about cats is they often will tell you their name. If you, if you wait, if you're patient, um, you, it sort of will come to you. When I was trying to name Magic and Mystic, I mean, I had this, this trend of sort of witchy kind of names. I had had, you know, cats you know, like Laris and Penates who were named after, you know, household gods. And, um, you know, I named their mother Minerva. That sort of came to me right away. Um, but I really wasn't sure about the kittens. And they were kittens when I got them. Uh, and, you know, I, I make gemstone jewelry. So I was thinking Onyx and Agate. And you know, then just it just sort of came to me that no, their names were magic and mystic. You know, it it wasn't it wasn't something that I made up. That was somebody whispered in my ear, pretty much. Um, so, and then there was Sawin, who was a uh, black and orange cat, and of course Sawin is the holiday that they yep. got Halloween from. Well, so, you know, black and orange cat with a little white. Her name was pretty darn clear, um, but uh, you have to be very careful what you name cats. When I was a student many thousands of years ago, I got this very adorable, cute little kitten. I mean, she was so cute, it just about killed you to look at her, and I couldn't think of anything other than cutesy names. So I said, all right, I'm going to be contrary and name her killer. Turned out that she had the sharpest claws in the, like, the planet. And I would come home from school, and she would come racing across the apartment and climb up me, because she was very lonely. You know, she was an only cat. And, uh, and she, really, she really was a killer. So um, I'm just saying, be very careful what you name your cats. Um, on the other hand, magic is the one and only true familiar I have ever had with my many billions of cats and being a witch for you know, however, you know, 20, 25 years, however long it's been. Um, and so clearly magic was the right name for her. And she was a very magical cat in a lot of ways. Um, one of the things that I have in the book is a spell for discovering your cat's name if you haven't figured it out on your own, you can do a spell that's pretty simple. Um, take a white candle, a bit of the cat's fur. You can either, you know, uh, brush them or, you know, when they're sleeping, you can snip a tiny little bit and, you know, not where, it, where it'll be missed or make them look funny and be laughed at by the other uh, cats. And uh, you can either have a, a list of possible names you've written out by hand or a book of names, uh, for instance... There's the Llewellyn Complete Book of Names for Pagans, Witches, Wiccans, Druids, Heathens, Mages, Shamans, and Independent Thinkers of all sorts. Go ahead, say that five times fast. Um, so you would light the candle, place the fur on the book or the list, and say the spell, which is very simple. Um, it's If the cat will hang around with you while you say the spell... That's really great, but it doesn't matter. It's fine to say it if the cat's not there. That's what the fur is there for. And the spell is, a cat needs a name like a witch needs a cat. Perfect and fitting and right. A name for the daylight without a disguise. A name for the shadows of night. Help me to see this cat's proper name. The one that will fit like a glove. Let it ring in my ears and appear in my head. To suit this new cat that I love. All right, that and and it'll come to you. That's the hope. And sometimes you have to sleep on it. You know, sometimes it takes yeah. a couple of days. It doesn't necessarily happen as soon as you do the spell. Although it might, it might just pop into your head. Ding. And of course, in the book, I have you know a list of suggested possible witchy cat names both for male and female cats. Um, and, uh, you know, a, a few examples of, of cats with interesting names that belong to famous people. 
Mark Twain had cats named, I'm not making this up, Beelzebub, Blatherskite, Buffalo Bill, Apollinaris, Sin, Sour Mash, Tammany, and Zoraster. Not all at once, I would guess. Oh, uh, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> and of course, you know, there was T.S. Eliot who wrote Old Possum's Book of Practical Cats. Um, yes. And he had all sorts of oddly named cats. Hmm. Wow. I can't go getting too tongue-tied. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, which is why my cat is named Moo. Yeah, Moo. Well, that is that is basic. I mean, that's that's pretty uh, that's pretty good. Uh, yeah. Well, um, Jimmy Carter, the president, had a cat named Misty Malarkey Ying Yang Number One, which I just love. Nice. He the, he clearly had a whimsical side. Um, Ernest Hemingway had eight cats at the same time named Alley Cat, Crazy Christian, Ecstasy, F. Puss, Fats, Friendless Brother, Dillinger, and Pilar. I'm guessing what can F I say? Was, writers, writers are very odd. I'm, I'm guessing the F was just more euphemistic than what he Perhaps. would actually say. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Now, normally, up till up till the recent cats that I currently have, uh, I I tended to name my cats after deity. I had Bast, uh, I had Isis, uh, Marigan, Freya, uh, um, and then when I got Puka as sprites, they were the first true kitten kittens mm-hmm. I'd ever had. I had always adopted them from shelters, and these guys were brought. You know, oh, we found these kittens and they gave them to my friends and they said okay you're in charge of taking care of these guys of course you were and um eventually and i'm thinking you know i'm thinking what you know who and i could not get a deity name in my head to fit them uh so i just figured you know i i, I should have gone more alliterative uh but i went with puka for the male and sprite for the female i should have really called her pixie but um because <laughs> you know puka and pixie well, but there. apparently pixie was not her name Apparently not. So, but uh, yeah, Puka knows his name. Oliver, Oliver, I'm pretty sure knows his name, and Oscar, I'm, uh, relatively certainly, he kind of knows his name. So, and for some reason, I don't know why I went with Oscar and Oliver with them, but the the fact that as kittens, they were they really looked identical. I mean, you had to stare at their faces to tell that one of the ginger eyes were like, had a little white rim around it, almost like those orange right. uh, ice creams you used to eat on a stick. Um, and so I was saying, okay, you're, you're definitely Oscar. You're definitely Oliver. And when I would carry them around, I would simply repeat their names back and forth, both Oscar and Oliver, Oliver, Oscar over and over and over. So that, that they would hear that whenever I was carrying them around. So and I think that's why it drilled into their little heads. Wow. Um, we was talking about, uh, well, I don't know if we was talking about it or not, but the uh, <laughs> some of the uh, cats. Yes, we're about to. Yeah, we are. Uh, like uh, Bast was an Egyptian goddess. Right. Uh, Freya was a Norse goddess. Yes. Uh, and, so, and the Morrigan was the Celtic goddess. In and fact, the Morrigan is often mistaken for family banshees because she would do uh, if a if a uh, uh, someone who was about to go to war was in the woods and would see a woman washing uh, a, a bloodstained shirt in the uh, in the river or the stream, uh, they realized, oh, she's washing my bloody shirt. That means that that man probably would fall in battle because she was also a war deity. Yeah, there are a few a few deities who are particularly associated with cats. Not a lot. I was actually sort of surprised. I mean, Bast is obviously the best known, and you know, many of us witchy types have you know, statues of Bast in one form or another on our altars or around our house, uh, either in the the form of a woman with a with a cat's head, or you know, of a you know a black cat. Um, 
with you know, usually like sort of Egyptian gold jewelry on, um, and and of course, uh, you know, we all know that she's the guardian of cats, um, but she's world. also. Yeah, she's also associated with motherhood and fertility, which makes sense with the cats, and um, love and sex and music, which also sort of makes sense when you think about cats. Yeah, because yeah, they put on these little community theater plays all the time. I, oh, wait, no. I don't. <laughs> well, they, they have music that they make. You may or may not think it's all that musical to your ears. Yeah. Um, when it's not but, winter, yeah. Yeah, but you know she's she's a good protective goddess for new cats, uh, new kittens, or even a new baby. Um, she was very much a, a mother cat. Um, now, you know the Egyptian deities also included um, Mut and Hathor, Mut M U T, not two T's, uh, Hathor and Sekhmet, um, who some saw as a lioness form of Bastet who are more associated with wild cats and, um, you know, lionesses, that sort of thing. So if you have a particularly wild cat, you might want to, you know, call on one of them instead of Bast, uh, or in addition, of course, to Bast. Um, but yeah, there are, there are a few goddesses, and I, you know, I talk about them in the book. Um, you know, Sekhmet is more fierce, um, yeah, you know, she was more the ruler of the under, underworld, right? Well, right. well she was the called two. the lion-headed or the terrible one or the powerful one. She was the goddess of war and, ironically, healing. Although, you know, that could be convenient if you're in war a lot. Um, but she was uh, she was supposed to be the daughter of Ra, the sun god. So she was also a solar goddess, and she's somebody that's good to call on if you need a fierce defender or an ally, say you decided to do protection work for your cat or for your home, it would be good to call on her because she's the fierce one. And, cool. and uh, Raw sometime appeared as a huge cat. Oh, yes. So, yes. And uh, Freya, while you know, she didn't appear as a cat, she was very fond of cats. She was Norse and was sometimes called the mistress of cats. And um, farmers who wanted to, to get on her good side would put out milk for stray cats. I'm pretty sure the cats were the ones that started that rumor. Um, <laughs> yeah. And she actually uh, was said to have uh, ridden in a, in a chariot that was pulled by two massive cats, which I sort of love that image of two gigantic cats pulling a chariot if i could figure out how to do that i would well my freya we we decided that she was in disguise because if you really examined the, her markings she looked like a plain tabby cat with a white bottom but if you really looked at it it was like she was a white cat disguising herself as a tabby with a tabby cloak and a mask because if you looked at her face the top had the tabby face with white uh, eyeliner, as it were, as though a tabby mask had been put over the white face, and then it was a tabby back going down the sides like a cape and the tabby tail, but everything from, the, from like the midsection down was white as snow. Oh, that's so cool. Hmm. One of the things that I had fun researching when I wrote this book was you know, myths and folklore and tales, and... There's a Chinese cat creation myth, which I really loved because it seems very appropriate. The Chinese say that when the world began, the gods appointed cats to make sure things were running smoothly and gave them the gift of speech to help them communicate clearly. But cats were more interested in sleeping under cherry trees and chasing the falling blossoms. They couldn't be bothered to be in charge of the world and suggested to the gods that perhaps humans might be better at the job. The gods were disappointed, but agreed to take the power of speech away from cats and give it to humans instead. Alas, humans turned out to be not very good at the job either. We were allowed to keep the power of speech, but cats were put back in charge where they remain to this day. That's my favorite myth. Um, I think we're going to go ahead and take our last break 
and uh, when we come back, uh, uh, we'll talk about some more of the spells that you have in the book. So, uh, Jeff, you want to take us out? Yeah, well, you're still listening to The Paranormal View on PowerHyphenX.com with your hosts, Henry Foister, Ceiling Cat, Barbara Duncan, and myself, Jeffrey Gould, with tonight's uh, wonderful returning guest author, Deborah Blake. So stay tuned for more of The Paranormal View and Kitty Talk after the break. Parax Radio, programming for the open mind. And welcome back, everybody, right here to the Paranormal View on the Parax Radio Network. I want to thank everybody for taking the time to be with us tonight, those listening here in the chat room, and those listening from around the world. We appreciate you. So uh, we have back with us Barbara Duncan. Yep, I'm here. And we have Jeffrey Gould. Hello, hello. And we have our great guest, Deborah Blake. Present. All right. Uh, great book. Uh, if you like cats, uh, it's a it's a great book to get. A lot of interesting stuff in there. Uh, talks about the, all the different types of cats and different things going on with them. And then she also talks about spells and magic that you do uh, with cats. Um Let's see, um, what do you do if uh, you have two cats and, I mean, they'll get along sometimes, but then if if our male, like, the little female cat can be in my lap, and if the male wants to jump up there too, oh, she'll start hissing and wanting to fight. Um, how do you get them to get along? Uh, begging, groveling, and treats. Oh, you mean magically. Uh, <laughs> well, um, yes. Uh, I mean, there, there are lots of practical things that you can do. And I always advise people to start with the practical things. I mean, I'm a very practical witch. And you don't necessarily start with magic. Magic is, is like DEFCON 3. Uh, but if you've tried the regular things and nothing is working, then there is a spell in the book um, for a tranquil household. I, you know, I've had this issue myself with cats that did not get along. Um, my cat Mystic would occasionally beat up on the female cats. He got along fine with other boy cats. For some reason, he was kind of a bully with the girl cats. Um, and uh, so the, there's a pretty simple spell uh, for trying to smooth things over in the house and get everybody to get along better. It's a good one to do during the dark moon, but you can do it whenever you need. If you can get the cat or cats in question to sit with you, that's always great. If not, um, it's not a problem. And let's face it, if the cat was cooperative, you probably wouldn't need the spell. Um but you can use either a white or a light blue candle, a bit of the problem cat's fur or something to symbolize the cat, like their food dish or a collar or even just a picture. If you say you have two cats that are not getting along with each other, you can take a picture of each one and put that um, in front of you when you're doing the spell to help focus you. Um, some kind of a calming stone if you have one, like... Um, rose quartz or lapis you can burn a little bit of lavender incense or put a little lavender essential oil on a candle because again lavender is calming um and fill a dark bowl with water you put the candle behind the bowl of water so that its light is going to fall on the surface and you light it and the incense if you're using it. And keep in mind that all of this extra stuff is basically used to help you focus, um, to sort of get your intent out there. You don't have to use it. You're perfectly welcome to do the spell without any extras or to just use the pictures of the cats or clippings of their fur or whatever. Um, but whatever you're going to be using, sprinkle a little bit of the water from the bowl on the cat's fur or whatever you're using to represent the cat and say the spell. Calm as the water, soft as the air, bring peace to this household and all those who share. Strong like the earth, 
bright like the fire, send calm and tranquility as I desire. Smooth ruffled fur, mend bad behavior, let tranquility reign for all here to savor. And then you just sort of sit in front of the candle and visualize everybody getting along well. And it's something, you know, if it doesn't work right away, you can, you know, do it every night for a little while or do it periodically. Um, and hopefully it'll help. All right. Um, I have a question from the chat room. <clears throat> um, it's from Nyla. And uh, she wanted to know... Uh, how do you use uh, your cats uh, in your magic? Um, or do you think uh, their presence enhances your work? Well, I definitely think you know their presence in general enhances things. It really depends um, on whether you have a cat that is specifically magical or not. You know, like I was talking about with my cat magic, she really did come and sit during ritual, and I believe she added power to the rituals. Her mother, Minerva, while she didn't come to the formal rituals, if I was saying a spell by myself, she would come and she would sit at my feet and yowl, which either was uh, her you know, going along with the spell or adding her own two cents. It's sort of hard to say. The, the cats that I have now... I mean, the young ones are still pretty young. They're a little over a year old, and nobody so far has shown any inclination towards magic in particular. Um, but I still think that their presence in, you know, I mean, I think cats are inherently mystical. Um, some of them are more magical than others, but I think it, it you know, helps to have them around. If they're willing to come and sit with you when you do magic, I think they definitely can lend that extra power. If they're not, uh, you know, it certainly, uh, you know, it doesn't hurt anything to have them in the house. Barbara? She's, she's sorry. <laughs> meditating. <laughs> no, I'm just listening. <laughs> Oh, don't listen to me. That's crazy talk. <laughs> All right. Well, with my with my cats, um, and of course, my, my first metaphysics teacher pointed out that uh, one thing that can walk in and out of a magic circle is a cat, without you know consequence to the magic involved and the focus involved. Cats, cats are like, I go right, well, please. What? What are you going to do? And um, but. Um, I can't, I, none of my cats have been really into magic per se. I mean, they're, they, they're fine. I mean, they're fine with it, but they're not really into, you know, if I do, you know, candle magic or anything like that, they're just like, yeah. Yeah. Magic. My cat magic was the first cat in, in all the years that I've been practicing who had any interest and who was clearly a familiar and one of the things that that I'd like to say, because it's important, is that you cannot force a cat to be a familiar if they are not. And you should oh, yeah. never go out and get a cat. I mean, if you're looking for a familiar and you go out and find a cat that you like, that's wonderful. But if that cat doesn't turn out to be a familiar, you can't just then dump that cat and go out and you know, look for... Look for a different one. All you know, cats any cat, cat. Right. Any cat that you bring into your house, whether they turn out to be magical or not, or whether or not they turn out to be a familiar, you know, you've you've taken that on. You've made a commitment. And you know, I think that if you put it out into the into the universe that you would like a familiar and you know, and there's one out there for you, and there isn't always, um, then you know, they, they will show up if, if they're meant to be there. Um, you, you, can't, you can't, well, anybody who has cats knows you can't make them do anything. Um, but you certainly cannot make them be interested in magic or want to be a familiar. And if that's the, you know, the way it is, you, 
you know, you need to just accept that and and you know, get, get on with doing your magic and just be happy that their energy is there. Um, you know, I think when you start talking about cat magic, you know, we, we all would like to have a familiar. And not all familiars are cats. You know, I know people who have dog oh. familiars, snake familiars, um, oh. you know, all sorts of things. You know, all you can do is is just hope that, you know, one will show up. I mean, I I got three new cats hoping that one of them would, in fact, take Magic's magical place in the household. And as far as I can tell, none of them has any interest in it at all. Um, although one has yeah. taken over her role at helping with the energy healing that I do, which is kind of neat. Um, and they may grow into it. They may not. I will not love them one iota less if they aren't magical cats. If they if they're just wonderful cat cats. Well, that makes me wonder whether or not you know the the stereotypical cat lady who has forty seven cats. Like, oh, not this one. Got to try again. <laughs> that that might be. That might very well be. It's like the 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 guy who keeps you. Know, having children hoping he's going to get a boy and ends up with 10 girls. Wow. So, so the woman no, who's like father the Burt Reynolds movie girls. where at the end it's got like a... <laughs> yeah. Now... And, you know, the other thing that, that you know, this in, in this same line, you know, in the book I talk a lot about using, you know, a little bit of cat fur or their, their nails or whiskers or whatever. Um, you, you know, you should... Never ever cut a cat's whiskers. They do occasionally lose one, you know, on their own. Um, you can use, like, if you're clipping your cat's nails, which we were talking about earlier, you can use the clipping of the nails, um, or you know, they they shed the if sheet. You can catch the them. Um, yeah, if, but, they, if they don't go flying across the room. Right. Yeah, which they often do. Uh, but you know, never do anything cruel to your cat to uh to get you know the supplies for ritual because you can always just take a picture you know if they are not willingly you know giving up yeah. bits of pieces of themselves there are other ways to do it and you can you know you can clip the tiniest little bit of their fur if they will sit still for that and it's safe um but you know, I I don't want people out there scalping their cats so that they can do magical work. I obviously I shed on that. Obviously, shed fur is different for right from the right. Yes, yeah, unless shed, you shed like stroking them. Fine. Unless you know, if if you brush your cat, you can use the the fur that comes out of the brush. Um, you know, and and then you brush your cats, which most of them will actually like. Um, you know, there there are lots of ways to get. Uh, little bits and pieces of of cat to use with your rituals. I mean, and there are some things like I have, uh, you know, a protection spell for for cats, um, healing spells, things like that. Um, and you can you can also you know use their little bits and pieces for that, but just make sure you're doing it kindly. Um, you know. I've also got a few fun crafty kind of things that you can do. Like, you know, you can make a, a cat protection charm that you could put on their collar if they were a collar. Um, you know, that sort of thing. I even have recipes. Well, for the cats, cook. not for you. I mean, <laughs> this is not cat. Not how to cook your cat, I hope. No, no, no. That would be, well, gross. <laughs> oh, gamey. Yeah, I, I'm just going to say, you know, you'd have to plump them up for a while, I think. But no, I've got a recipe for four different kinds of treats. There's fish straws and catnip and cheese balls and beef snack bites. You don't have to use the whole cow. Um, and grain-free dehydrated treats. Um, you know... I, it's yeah. You know, there, there's some fun things. I had a lot of fun with the book, and so I did. You know, I did some craft things, and I did you know a couple of little recipes, and uh, you know some uh, sort of fun things along with the more serious spells. <clears throat> I also talked about power animals. You know, because we you know, many of the people who are involved with witchcraft 
you know, like the idea of power animals. And of course, there are many of those that are cat related. The bobcat, cheetah, leopard, lion, lynx, mountain lion, which is a really traditional one, panther, tiger. And of course, you can have a domestic cat as your power animal if you want to. And so there's spells for, you know, discovering what your power animal is and for connecting with it, you know, the attributes of that power animal. And, is that the same um, as a spirit animal? Yes, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I mean, people use different terms. Uh, we used to call them totem animals, <clears throat> yeah. but that's cultural appropriation. We don't do that. So power animals are a spirit animal. Hmm. You uh, Did you ever uh, read uh, Ted Andrews? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, he's, he was a very <laughs> prolific writer, sadly, no longer with us. Um, he, he wrote a book called Animal Speak about power animals and spirit animals. Um, almost any aspect of, uh, the craft and metaphysics, he's, he's pretty much written on it. And it's tough to know, to know about him nowadays because A, he's passed and B, you don't have brick and mortar bookstores anymore to go to the new age section yeah, and see like it. dozens of books by Ted Andrews, like, whoa, this guy's written a lot. But um yeah, he yeah. uh yeah, Barnes he and Noble funny. is pretty much the only place in their their sections are smaller. I was in one uh I guess back at the beginning of October I was passing through t a town that had one because mine does not. Um and there were a few of my books there which always sort of tickles me. <laughs> um yeah, that's that's a happy thing. Um, but yeah, it is it is trickier to find um, you know the magical books. I mean, luckily I'm with Llewellyn, and they do a really good job of of promoting their authors. Yeah, but Ted, course, Ted is through Llewellyn. Yeah, you know, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, and and you know, of course, you can look online. Um, but if if you're if you're not a a, a big name pagan, which I don't really consider myself to be, you know, there's, there's usually a bunch of names that show up before yours does. I'm sort of hoping that a book called the little book of cat magic will sort of sell itself. What? I've got, I've got a cat. You were asking if somebody, if anybody talked, we've got somebody in the other room who's suddenly talking. I don't know what they're talking about. Um, but I, I worry. Well, so, like, yeah. oh God, maybe they maybe. should. Maybe you should have bookstores uh, have other copies of the same book in the animal section. I well, you know, if it were up to me, they'd have the, a copy of my book in every section. There you go. Well, you know, they could put it in with the romance because I love my cats. Um, yeah. You know, they could put it in with mysteries because cats are a mystery. Uh, yeah. They could put it in with you know science and nature. Yeah, we could, you know, we could definitely put this cat in every section, except maybe, you know, like the Christian section. I don't know that it would fit all that well there. Are you you're aware that the na the word cat is nowhere in the Christian Bible, right? I was not aware of that. Is that true? That is true. If you look up at a, get a Bible concordance and look up the word cat, it ain't there. That's so weird. Yeah. I wonder why that is. Do, do you know why that is? I didn't write the Bible. <laughs> are, you, are you sure? Because I thought I saw your name on the on the front page. Oh, there you go. <laughs> that was now the closest the closest to magic any of my cats have uh, have done uh, was my second cat, who's the only one that I deliberately didn't name after a goddess her name was mickey because she looked like the gray tiger stripe cat that my parents had when they first got married so we said it's a mickey cat you gotta call her mickey um but she had uh like you said uh both my cats had collars the cats we have now they're all naked uh, yeah. uh but bass had a collar and uh mickey had a collar and they were both indoor cats uh but mickey was not thrilled having a collar whereas bass was like as long as i'm sleeping in your arms i'm fine with mickey was uh say hey i used to be an outdoor cat i used to be a semi-feral cat i don't like this thing on my neck so every so often she would manage to get it off and if she managed to get it off in one piece you just put it back on she's like fine another month or two would be off again but every so often she would pop the little elastic thing and completely <laughs> wreck it i have to go 
to the shelter where I worked anywhere and just grab another one and put the tag on it and put it back on her. So one day the, the, the collar comes off and I look everywhere and I can't find it. I'm like, wow, oh, where did she hide it this time? You know, because sometimes she'd hide it behind a sofa or something. And we were about to move and I said, well, keep an eye out for Mickey's collar because we don't know, you know, obviously she's got a new one, but I don't know where she hid it. I, I'm very curious as to where she hid it this time. We cleared that entire house and my parents were the type that like cleaned every corner um, when moving to make sure it was a clean house. That collar did not turn up and she did not go outside. And I'm thinking, all right, where did she pass into another dimension to say, <laughs> now they'll never find it and then come back in, you know. That's why you never it found up. it? Never. It was. It just did not. And the thing is, is I always said, you know, if you see Mickey's collar, let me know. It's not like you just pick it up and toss it in the trash. So, you know, I was like, no, we never saw it. I'm like, uh, well, you know, stupid I interdimensional cat. make things appear and disappear in a truly, truly impressive way. Oh, yeah. And not just my food. <laughs> now, a lot, of, a lot of people has cats that uh, they let outside and then the cat will come back in. Um, ours never goes outside. Ours always stays in the house, but. Yeah, if, mine too. If, if somebody did that and a cat got lost, do you have a spell also for them to help find a lost cat? Yeah, well, you know, when I sat down to write the book, uh, you know, and obviously, you know, there's a, there's a lot of cat things, but I thought, well, what are the things over the, the many years that I have had cats that I would want a cat spell for? And, and so, you know, that was one of the things I, you know, when I had cats that went outside, I did have ones that went missing, uh, some of whom came back and some of whom did not. Um, and, and so I, I thought, well, okay, that's something I want to include. And the, the spell components for that, if you're going to use them is if, if you've got a cat who's lost, um, a picture of the cat, if you have one, um, a bit of the cat's fur, if you if you you know don't have you know something specific, you can find some in a brush, or even on the floor or on the furniture. You know, I mean, my my furniture is always covered with cat fur. Um, cut a piece of paper into the shape of a heart, or you, if you have like a heart shaped stone, you could use that. Um, a pen and a white candle, um, optional if you want a picture or a, or a statue of Bast, because as a mother cat goddess she would be good at helping to find a lost kitten whether it's full grown or not um and uh place all the supplies on a on an altar or table light the white candle on the piece of paper draw a picture of a house i mean it it can be pretty stick drawing it doesn't have to be anything fancy um you don't have to worry about being an artist um with a figure next to it to represent you and then write the cat's name inside the house um, then you place the picture and the fur, uh, you know, picture or whatever it is you're using to represent the cat on top of that paper where the cat's name is inside the house and say the spell, which is very simple. Um, when you light the candle, you say, let this light guide, put the cat's name in there, back to me, let them hear my heart's call and return home. Safe and sound sound and safe vast goddess of cats watch over mine and send them back to me soon let this guide let this light guide the cat back to me now so mode it be and then leave the candle burning in a fire safe candle until you need to put it out and repeat it every day until the cat comes home or until it becomes clear that he or she probably won't and hopefully that will help you know that energy will help guide the cat home or perhaps guide you to the cat while you are out searching. Now, cats, um, they sense a lot of stuff. Um, we have a fairly good size room outside of our bedroom upstairs uh, where we have it like a little reading room kind of. And um, 
Ooh, always a good thing. Yeah, well, she'll, both of them will be on the bed sometimes, and uh, our door's always open uh, in the bedroom. But they'll be laying there sleeping on the bed, and all of a sudden, they'll sit up and look out into that middle room like they're seeing something, and we already found out that their hearing is very good. So they sense things and see things. What do you think a cat sees? Well, sometimes it's something mundane, like a mouse in the wall, um, you know, I've had that happen. Uh, you know, I'll I'll walk into the kitchen sometimes and find all three kittens staring at either the stove or the you know the wall in there somewhere, which probably means there is a mouse back there somewhere. However, I've also seen cats just stare at a wall, and I'm pretty sure there's or or at the air. You know, I mean, you've seen that, I'm sure, where a cat's staring at something incredibly intently. And, you know, what what I believe is that they're sensing some kind of a spirit, uh, not necessarily a ghost kind of spirit. You know, it could be an elemental. It could be, you know, it could be anything. But, yeah, they're they're clearly very sensitive. And as you say, their, their hearing is extremely good. But I, I think they sometimes sense things that we do not. You know, I, I mentioned um, that, you know, I have, have had cats that help me with the energy healing work I do. I do uh, what I call intuitive energy healing. It's it's a variant on, like, Reiki, that kind of thing. Um, but it just came to me as a gift as opposed to something that you learn. And um, Magic was really good at this, but I've had other cats who do it, too, they would jump up on the person I was working on. It was lying on, you know, like a massage table. And they would sit on exactly the spot where the main problem was. How they knew where that spot was, I do not know. But they certainly knew. And they would sit there and, you know, the person could usually feel, you know, the spot get warmer or energy moving. Um, and then eventually the cat would move to another spot or get down from the table Um, but you know, it's sort of remarkable to me that they somehow are sensing something and, um, in, you know, I think are attracted to the energy of the healing itself. The first person who ever did Reiki on me had a cat who did that every single time, got up, you know, as soon as you started doing the work, they were attracted to the energy, got up on the table, uh, you know, and sat on top of you. And, and she apologized and said, do you mind? And I said, are you kidding? Anytime a cat lies on me, I'm happy. And if they can help with the healing, that's even better. But, yeah, I think they definitely sense things. Um, I had a cat when I was a teenager. I mean, you know, teenage years are rough. And I, my bedroom was on the second floor of our, of our house. And there was a pine tree outside my window. And I had this cat who was my best friend and... And she would be outside roaming around doing her cat thing. And I would be all upset about, you know, something that happened to school or something mean that somebody said to me. Nobody liked me back then. Shocking, I know. Um, And, you know, I would be up in my room crying and she would literally climb that pine tree, sit outside my window, whack her paw against the window until I opened it up and then come in and comfort me. How she knew from wherever she was that I was upset, I don't know. She just did. Well, I know uh, sometimes we have heard things in in this house. Um, not that there's anything bad or anything like that spirit-wise. Um, but uh, I was here in my computer room one night, and um, I was here on the computer. I wasn't doing the show. Um, and, uh, we have a bathroom right outside the door here across from my computer room. And I heard, uh, sounded like my wife said, there you are, little girl, which, uh, we keep a little water bowl in a spare uh, bedroom there, uh, bathroom. And, um, I clearly heard her say that there you are, little girl. And that's what we call the our little female cat 
And she took, uh, I went out, opened the door up, and there wasn't nobody there. And I went downstairs, and I asked her, I said, what would you want? And she says, what do you mean? I says, well, I just heard you upstairs. And she said, no, I've been down here cooking or doing something there in the kitchen. Because oh! I haven't been upstairs. And uh, so we know that, that there's things around like that. And I think a lot of times it's uh, our cats, when they see things, they'll sit there and ears all be perked up looking out into the middle room and everything but i never see anything so uh, they sense things i know they do yeah they right. definitely do i think they're way more in touch with things than we are i have another little odd story about cats recognizing their names um my my brother had a girlfriend who had a little yep very young kitten who had just old enough to start, you know, cognizing what people were saying to it. And um, it was a tuxedo cat. So it had little black splotches on the white face and all. And she couldn't figure out what to name the cat. My brother jokingly says, oh, his name is Pitface. And she's like, what? He says, oh, it's Pitface. So she would bring the kitten over to our place and my mother was aghast. She says, you can't name a cat Pitface. You've got to name it Pixie or something. But by that time, the cat knew its name was <laughs> Pitface. And when the family all went up to Boston for the weekend, and I was home alone with our dog lady, who we trained to be fine with cats. And this is before we got a cat. And Pitface would sleep on my chest while I was watching TV. And this was so far back in the 1980s. They didn't have remotes yet. You had to physically get up and change channel. So I would get up and she would scurry off. And after a while, she'd come back and sleep on my chest while I'd watch another hour program and whatever. And every so often, she'd go into the main living room where the lights were out. And occasionally, she would kind of try and sharpen her claws on the cloth furniture. And I could hear the rip, rip, rip. And all I had to say is, pit face. And you hear, and she would run away. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize you could hear that. <laughs> yes, they they are remarkable. You know, I I feel very fortunate to have them in my life. I've had cats you know, since I was a, a little kid. Um, the only time in my entire life when I did not have a cat was the couple of years when I was in college and living in dorm rooms and you know, couldn't have one. And Literally, as soon as I could possibly move out into an apartment, I did, in part because I hated the dorms, and in part so I could have a cat, because it yeah. was just, you know, unnatural for me not to have a cat. I mean, I like dogs, too, don't get me wrong. I think dogs are lovely. Um, but, but yeah, I'm, I'm definitely a crazy cat lady. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I have a question dogs, from the right? chat room. Um, wanting to know about cat visitations after they pass on and if you had experiences along those lines. Um, I actually, I, I have, um, I have a, I have a couple of interesting stories about, about dead cats. Um, the, the first one is, um, my cat Sawin, the one who was, who was black and orange, um, you know, I had gotten her from the shelter and she was this tiny little thing. And she was one of the ones that Big Mystic used to go after. So she she and, and Angus would hang out in the room upstairs, um, the cat room, as we called it, otherwise known as the guest bedroom. And then she would come down and be out you know, when I was out and about. But she was very affectionate and very sweet and stubborn. And we she had a chronic renal failure, and we fought it for six years. I mean, it was amazing that she made it that long she got it when she was very young so she was otherwise healthy uh, but we did sub-q fluids at home and all of this stuff and uh, she finally passed um, probably had a, a stroke but she was she was right at the very end um, and you know I brought her into the vet the next morning my wonderful vet who you know had had fought with me to keep this cat alive and my best friend met me there and uh, up until that point, <coughs> I've always had my cats cremated, but I would send them out in mass ashes. You know, I didn't, I didn't keep the ashes and get them back because it didn't, you know, they weren't there. <coughs> Excuse me, tickle. 
and they was filling out the paperwork for Samhain, and they went to check the little box that said, you know, send them out in, a, in the mass cremation. And I could not make my hand check the box. <coughs> Sorry. And it was the wildest thing. I finally moved my hand over the box that said, get the cat's ashes back. That one I could check, no problem. And in fact, I didn't feel right until I got the box of ashes back home. And I truly believe she wanted to come home. I never had a cat who did that before. And yet, she was not going to let me check that other box. She was very clear about what she wanted. And as soon as I brought the box home and put it on my altar, things got very quiet. You know, I could sort of sense her there, but not in a very strong way. She was home and that was what she wanted. She wanted to be home with me. And, and so, you know, that was that. Now, when Magic and Mystic died, um, Earlier this year, I, I lost them both in January, eight days apart, which was hell on earth. Um, and they both had cancer. Mystic had had cancer for, well, since the March before. And we'd had this really long struggle to keep him alive. Um, and he was a trooper. And Magic had gotten a different kind of cancer. Uh, I think she was diagnosed in, in October. And it was pretty much every day there was a chance I was going to come home and find her, her dead. It was horrible. Um, but after I lost them, I lost her on the 3rd of January and, and him, you know, eight days later, uh, literally the day after their 16th birthday, um, I could feel her presence, especially so strongly that, you know, she, like I said, you know, she used to sit behind me on the couch and supervise my writing, and I would be sitting at the laptop, and without even thinking about it, I would reach back to pet her because I could so strongly feel her there. And they both slept with me. Magic used to sleep by my head, and Mystic would sleep by my feet. And I would go to bed at night, and I could feel them there. And it's been, you know, obviously a number of months, and it's not as strong, but I, I definitely sense them both here, and that is not something that has happened with other cats. It was, it was really particular to these cats. You know, so it doesn't happen all the time. I've had cats I was really, really close to who I thought for sure would come back around and didn't. Um, so, so it, you know, don't don't think that if you don't get a visitation from your cat, it means they don't love you. Um, you know, I adored my grandmother, and she adored me. She never showed up, that woman. Um, <laughs> so, so you know, I mean, sometimes they're just ready to be done. I think Magic and Mystic knew that I was just missing them terribly, and and it's distinctly possible that Magic felt I still needed supervision. And and she wanted to make sure that I was you know, doing things correctly with the new cats and, and all the rest of it. I don't expect they will stay around forever, but I do find it a great comfort. Well, do you think, think that they reincarnate back? Oh, I do. Absolutely. Um, I, you know, I, I have always hoped that the cats that I've loved the most would come back to me. I've never had a sense that one of mine did. I know other people who have had that happen where it was, it was pretty clear in some pretty spooky ways that it was their old cat back again. Um, my grandmother might come back as a cat. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I do. I do believe that they, they have at least nine lives. I mean, I also believe people reincarnate. So you know, that's sort of part of my, my general, uh, belief system but yeah i i think i think no energy is lost you know if you you lose that particular animal or person at that time in that form in this particular lifetime and maybe with cats because they 
you know, go through lifetimes more quickly, you might end up with one that comes back, um, if not in this lifetime, perhaps in another. And I do, I do find that as a consolation as well. And you've also got the Rainbow Bridge. Yes, I, you know, I, I think here's here's my here's my theory for, for you know my great philosophical theory, um, backed up in fact by some of my experiences it, under hypnotherapy, which is a whole other show topic. Um, yes. But um, I, I think that when we pass, uh, you know. Some part of us may stay hanging around here for a little while, uh, like magic and mystic are. Um, in general, I think what happens is you move on. You go to a place where there is where you rest and regroup, and that can be you know some people see that as you know, the the, you know, the the lands beyond. It's you know. The summer lands, whatever you want to call it, um, in in hypnotherapy, my experience of it has actually been just sort of this very gray, quiet, restful place. I, I'm sort of hoping that uh, on some level, I'm dancing around in the summer lands, having parties, um, and then whenever you're ready, or whenever it is your time, yeah, you come back around, and for people, I think you get a chance to learn the lessons you didn't master in this lifetime or the lifetime before that. I think for cats, you just get to be a cat. Our time, unfortunately, is just flew right on by, but as I can figure out that uh, you've probably done talked enough. <laughs> what? Yeah, she's losing her voice. <laughs> yeah. But a, well, that's that's mostly just uh, sinus stuff and and pollen and crap. But <laughs> but at least no smoke. <laughs> well, that's good. Uh, but our time is running right on by. And uh, what I want you to do is uh, give out your website and where people can get your books and all the good stuff if they want to follow you. And then we want you to stay on till we're off. We'll talk with you for a second or two. Okay. Well, this particular book is called The Little Book of Cat Magic, Spells, Charms, and Tales. It's from Llewellyn, as all my witchy books are, all 11 of them, and a tarot deck called The Everyday uh, Witch Tarot. Um, my website is deborablakeauthor.com. Couldn't be much simpler. Um, I have a, a blog, which is Deborah Blake at blog, was it blogspot.com. Uh, if you go to my website, you can find links to my Facebook and Twitter. I'm on all those lovely things, Instagram. Um, I'm just, you know, I'm so boring. I'm Deborah Blake on Twitter. I'm Deborah Blake on Facebook. You can find me. Um, and I, you know, I do, I answer all messages and emails. So, you know, if, if people think of questions later on uh, that they wanted to ask me, you know, feel free. Um, and if you follow my blog, I'm always doing giveaways and fun things with my books. Uh, and yeah, I, I hope that people will come by and say hello and tell me that they heard me here. All right. And uh, with that, um, I guess. Uh, oh, and the books are available everywhere because they're from Llewellyn. You know, Amazon, Amazon, Barnes and Nobles. If you have a local indie bookstore, by all means, go request them from there. If they don't have it in stock, they can order it. So, yeah, go find my books. It's a very good book. You need to get it, too. Um, with that, uh, Jeff. Uh, yeah, yes. Our official website is theparanormalview.com. You can go to the Facebook uh, slash the Paranormal View. That's our uh, on on Facebook stuff. We put all kinds of uh, links to interesting articles as well as links to the uh, show podcast if you missed it during live. And um, you can follow me uh, on Instagram and Twitter at Real Badger. I'm on Facebook, and there you go. All right. Uh, we will see you next week at the same time. This is Henry Foister, Jeffrey Gould, and Barbara Duncan. So good night, everybody. Have a great uh, rest of the weekend. You've been listening 
to the Paranormal View on the Para-X Radio Network. Join us again next week at the same time for more of the Paranormal